Good morning. Um, welcome to this Futurescape panel discussion when we're going to be uh, focusing on the regeneration of the high streets. Hi, I'm Andrew Haley, and I've been asked this morning to, to chair this panel discussion by the Landscape Institute. Uh, the Landscape Institute are one of a number of organisations that um, are contributing experts to the High Street Task Force. The High Street Task Force kicked off earlier this year and it is looking at the future of our high streets across England and how we need to uh, help them to adapt, the skills that we need and the, the conversations that will be going behind uh, making them more resilient going forward. Landscape Institute say are one of a number of organizations, but this morning on the panel discussion, there are five of us who are our landscape architects. We're uh, members of the Landscape Institute and the Institute asked us to uh, have a discussion about the particular skills and insights that we as a profession bring to that. But we've also got this morning uh, Matt Davis from the core team of the High Street Task Force, um, who brings that insight of how the, the, the task force itself uh, is set up and the way it's supposed to work. So over the next hour and a bit, we're going to have uh, a conversation about the insights that we're seeing and then open that up to the floor. So. We're looking forward to uh, a conversation with, uh, with all of you in terms of um, the questions that you have and the ways in which uh, you can get involved. So without further ado, I'm going to ask um, the panel this morning to introduce themselves. So I'm going to start with, uh, with Laura. Uh, would you like to say good morning to us? Thank you, Andrew. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Laura from Benton Scott Simmons, a small private practice. We work in Scotland. We're based in, in Glasgow. Um, we have been working on public realm schemes uh, for a number of years. I have, uh, over my career, worked on public realm schemes. I think actually that Scotland has a lot to, to demonstrate how you can tackle some of the problems we're facing. Um, and I've worked at Cityscape and then right down to local towns and working with um, individual communities and uh, other groups. So I'm very much looking forward to sharing some of that knowledge that we've accrued over, over the years. Charlotte, would you like to follow on from that? Yeah, hi, thanks, Angie. Um, hi, everyone. My name's um, Charlotte Norman. I'm a Chartered Landscape Architect. I'm director of a practice called Area. Uh, we're based in East Anglia near Ipswich. Um, I've been working over the past 20 years um, as a landscape architect and consultant for uh, public realm schemes, sometimes standalone and sometimes associated with um, housing, um, commercial, education, healthcare, community, play, uh, projects of all kinds. Um, and I'm also uh, a member of a couple of design review panels uh, and a guest lecturer at Rittle University College in Chelmsford. Um, I'm originally a geographer uh, before training as a landscape architect and I also lived in Japan for uh, nearly seven years in the 90s so I uh, saw some quite different uses of, uh, of public space and, uh, and the rest. And I'm a, basically a kind of seasoned people watcher um, and um, my first job was in a greengrocer's on a small local high street in uh, West London. Brilliant. Tim, do you want to follow that one? Greengrocer yes. or uh, other skills to bring <laughs> to the conversation? Um, Ex-triathlete, actually. Oh, my um, goodness. Follow that. <laughs> uh, thanks, Andrew. Yeah, Tim Johns. Uh, I'm a landscape and urban designer. Um, been working in the northwest of England for well over 20 years. Currently working at the Environment Partnership in, in Warrington. Uh, and we have a number of offices around uh, England, including London uh, and Market Harbour. And, and been involved with various public realm, town centre regeneration type projects in the northwest uh, for a number of years. I applied to be on the task force really because I think um, we do have a great uh, tradi civic tradition on the high street in, in Great Britain, uh, but that, as you know, has been under threat for, for a number of years. So I think being part of this task force is an opportunity really to tap in the resources, uh, the great work that the uh, high street task force has done already. Uh, and really try to be part of that movement in terms of reinventing uh, the high street uh, going forward. I'm really particularly interested in rekindling the unique uniqueness of place 
and uh, that sense of place of high street and that's that's got a lot to offer and, and really just bring back that people presence into the high street fantastic and glenn last but by far uh, no, no means least would you like to introduce yourself and the button the mute button <laughs> there had to be one of course it was me Hello there, I'm Glenn McFarlane, the founding principal of McFarlane Associates. We're landscape architects and urban designers. And I'm absolutely delighted to be part of the High Street Task Force. Urban regeneration has been a passion uh, with me for as long as I can remember. I grew up in Glasgow, um, a child in the 70s, and with the decline of shipbuilding and a lot came a long period of social and economic deprivation in the city, and the effects of that were felt throughout the whole community. So the process of urban decay and urban repair and the role of landscape design in that really defines my work. So looking back in the 90s, I was involved in retail development, which was all about shopping centres. Um, and I was involved with uh, the planning and building of whole self-contained but remote retail and leisure centres, many of which are now struggling. In the noughties, the key retail schemes came back to the town centres with huge complex retail driven mixed use master planning with large anchor stores and multiples taking key positions in the town centre. From about 2010 onwards, the work um, has been about refurbishment and localised rebuilds, but still focused on the needs of the large retailers. So as a professional who, who looks for local identity to design meaningful public realm and successful green space, it's long been a worrying trend with the changing demographic of retail. In effect, the large multiples occupying more and more floor space in the town centres, independence in decline, and the diversity on offer reducing year on year. Many high streets are now offering the same homogeneity, losing that vital sense of place, so important to local community identity. So as a place designer, I jumped at the once in a generation opportunity to be involved in reversing the trend of decline and helping to redefine our high streets. So really happy to be here today. Glenn, thanks very much indeed for that. Matt, um, I, I didn't ask you yesterday when we were chatting. I'm assuming you're not a landscape architect. No, I, I'm not actually. No, I'm. Uh, so welcome to the fold. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Um, I, well, my background is I'm the communications lead for the High Street Task Force. So my background is, is sort of um, business and, and management. And I, I worked at the Institute of Place Management actually about 15 years ago, um, went away and did some other things, and then came back um, in the last 12 months when we've been delivering the task force. So um, I, can, I can probably give a good intro now or a short intro to the, great. the discussion. Yeah. Um, actually, I think Glenn's just done a very good job of, of summarizing some of the <laughs> issues that were. It really was. No, it's, it's good. Um, some of the things I don't have on my slides, but I'll, um, I'll share a few slides with you now. Just bear with me one second. I have uh, two buttons to, to, to press here. OK, you should be able to see something. Just get a nod from the panelists. Yep. If you can see a slide good. on the screen. Great. OK, so. Um, Welcome everyone, it's good, it's good to be here. I'll just do two or three minutes to set the context about what we're trying to achieve at the task force. Um, so who are we, first of all, if you've not heard or read about us? Um, as it says on the screen there, we're, we're a group of multiple organisations, an alliance, I think, is the branded word of who we are. And we've been commissioned by government. These are all the logos you can see on the screen of the, the, the core team there. And of course, I suppose the most relevant for this discussion, we have Landscape Institute at the top there, but we have other professional bodies that are involved in this alliance. So RTPI, Institute of Place Management, I mentioned, and the Design Council as well. Those are the four bodies from which we're drawing expertise and specialisms, if you like, to work directly with local authorities and with communities. But we consult a lot more widely than that. So we have a, a couple of groups where we bring in anyone and everybody who really has a role on the high streets and these are membership bodies who consult with us they've been doing that monthly over the COVID-19 crisis I think they'll be moving to do that quarterly and we have some sort of data providers and analysts and academics who are looking at um, 
well, things again, like Glenn was talking about, things like retail stats, spend, footfall, um, some of the social demographic type issues. And so we work with them to get a broader understanding. But um, the key things for today really is more directly what we do to support places. So we have four areas of delivery where we've been commissioned to run until 2024. You can see on the screen that the four areas we're working with, and I suppose the most relevant today is the top left, the boosting of local authority capacity. So we know that um, local authorities are massively challenged, not, not just um, during COVID, but previously in terms of resources, uh, you know, sort of time and expertise to look at some of the projects that they need to get done to transform and, and regenerate the high streets. So we'll be working directly with a lot of local authorities over the next uh, three to four years. Some of the other ones you can see on the screen, I think I've just spoken a little bit about coordinating an approach. We feed into government quite a lot about what we're seeing and the data especially. And we're doing a lot of things online. So the two uh, boxes on the right of the slide there, we put a lot of resources via our website. Um, we're providing access to data dashboards, quite a few different things. But what are we doing directly to boost that capacity that I talked about? So we will work with about half of the local authorities in England directly. We have funding to do that. Um, as I say, it's been interrupted by COVID slightly just from the very basic and operational kind of aspect of going and getting into places and walking around towns and cities and meeting people hasn't been possible over the, the past few months, but it will kickstart again. And we've been looking at how we deliver things a little bit more remotely. But, but, but as you know, you know, hopefully things will be back to, uh, well, at least so that we can go into towns from sort of March onwards next year. Um, and on the top row, I'll just draw your attention to some of these activities. Um, th there's roughly speaking a, a sort of order that we do things. We'll do some analysis on a place, first of all, when we know that we're going to be working with them. So we'll look at um, th their capacity for change and for work in the local area, but also their need. So when I talked about half of local authorities, that will be, there'll be a calculation on the need of those areas, looking at a few different stats. Um, and then most importantly, um, the next couple of, uh, on, on the top row there, diagnostic visits. So we'll send in one of our nominated experts, probably in a team of two mo most of the time. Um, we will meet with the local authority with quite a lot of community stakeholders. We'll have a look at some of their plans and what they think the issues are. We'll have a tour of the place. So basically, a, a information gathering exercise to understand the issues we'll digest that and then following that all the rest of it really is based on that analysis is to um, almost prescribe in some expertise based on what they're looking at doing so experts is, is one um, essentially consultancy of a, of a sort to go in and advise on um, projects and visions and some of the bigger things they're looking at i, I won't speak about everything on this slide but if, if you're interested it's on our on our website i'll give you the url at the end we're doing lots of things online. Uh, again, I'll, I'll leave those for now. But just to speak, um, lastly, just, just a little bit more broadly about our approach. Internally, we talk about redefining the high street. Um, now, it's a key message because, um, yes, retail is, is changing. It bricks and mortar retail has, has perhaps driven government investment. But we know, obviously, the change is a lot more broad than that um, technology, economies society, the behavior of consumers and how we use places, all of it is changing um, and was changing before COVID. So we want to advise on that. We have some broad underlining principles, um, some more buzzwords than others, but you, you get the point from those ones. Um, and we have some underpinning knowledge frameworks. So, so we get the, the question quite a lot of what is our sort of approach um, to place. So you can see the knowledge frameworks online, but broadly speaking, um, we'll, we'll take that analysis. Uh, uh, we have a framework at the Institute of Place Management that's been adopted, which is about reinventing, rebranding, restructuring, or repositioning. You can get a sense from those titles what the sort of priorities might be. Um, you know, we may go into a place and see that fundamentally they don't have the partnerships and capacity and knowledge to sort of get started and put shovels in the ground so so we may be at that end of the sort of journey if you like but alternatively that there may be some really good plans that just need to be enabled so so we'll follow those sort of underpinning frameworks um, last couple of slides now just to address the current context we're in 
as I mentioned, we can't go into towns at the moment um, in England. We've been doing some things online, supporting places with their COVID-19 recovery plans and response. Um, really, this is a framework that we published and we've been doing a lot of uh, webinars and, and online work around it, just trying to give people a sense of direction and what are the important um, priorities at the moment as they're sort of supporting businesses and, and, and residents at the moment. So we did some of that. Now, last two slides. Um, you can see, obviously, some of the challenges I've talked to throughout this presentation are on the screen here. So how do we address it? And, and specifically, what are the Landscape Institute and their experts going to do? Well, um, they're amongst the 180 plus experts, mentors and facilitators, facilitators that we appointed. And the last slide here, these are the specialisms, and this leads us into the discussion today. Um, each of the experts from the Landscape Institute has demonstrated they have a, a background and, and an expertise in one or more of these areas. So essentially, once we've gone into a place and done that diagnosis and that consultation, which is done by an expert, so it may well be a Landscape Institute expert that goes in there, supported by another, um, we, we would then get into the specific sort of consultation process to advise um, perhaps on one or more of these areas. So that, that's it from me. In, in essence, we're sort of... Um, Solution agnostic was a word I think I used yesterday when I was uh, chatting. Um, we have some frameworks, but we really want to enable you to do your work and, and to really um, put that capacity and resource into towns and cities to, to, to make a change. So that's it. And, and the last thing from me is if you want to read a bit more, there is um, highstreetstaskforce.org.uk and you can contact us via that as well. So hopefully that's useful and I'll, I'll hand back to Andrew now and you can kick off the, uh, the discussion. Matt, that's a really helpful scene setting bit, and I wonder whether at the end of this we could pop that last slide back up so people can jot down the uh, the contact details. Okay. I'm just having a quick look at the particip participant list here, and it's bright to see such a range of people um, on on the uh, uh, on this discussion this morning. And I guess we're very keen that it should be a discussion. So um, whilst we'll kick it off um, as we're having a chat. Please, could you start to think about the, the sort of questions that you would like to um, get involved with? Because the, I think we'll all get much more out of this by this being a, a participatory sort of uh, session. So um, please pop your uh, comments into the chat box. Um, we would love to hear your thoughts and we can pick those up uh, over the next wee while. I'd like to sort of kick off with um, Matt's talked about specialisms and, and the importance of that uh, in terms of uh, all of the experts that are coming to the High Street Task Force. The five of us are, have been appointed as experts, but we're all coming with the, uh, uh, the lenses of, uh, of landscape architects. And I'm going to suggest maybe, Glenn, if you'd like to kick off, I'd like to just tease out a little bit more what you think are some of those skills and um, uh, perspectives that as a, as a profession, we maybe bring to those conversations. And you've already started uh, in your introduction with some of those uh, those insights. Absolutely. So um, it's, it's interesting that the audience here and what you might be interested in and what we've been talking about so far is um, retail, the town centres, the offer of town centres. But I suppose uh, what a lot of the audience in this conference are interested in is space, space design, public space, green space, localised green space, the importance of green space. And, you know, how might the High Street Task Force work um, to benefit you or um, whether you might be able to get involved as a local stakeholder um, in your, your town centre? We've all got um, that town centre that we know and love well and have seen the changes over, well, really the last... 40 years um, uh, and uh, the, ch the change in, in retail and the offer in town centres, you might know a town centre that's, that's going particularly well and, um, uh, and th though also town centres that are not going particularly well. But I think where, where we are here, we're, we're a group of landscape architects, we're only one profession um, of a participating series of professions uh, that are offering skills as experts to the, the High Street Task Force. We're just one cog uh, in, a, in a bigger wheel. And our, our role really is about, I suppose, placemaking, localism, local agenda, uh, local space, green space. And along with COVID, um, never has 
localized green space and access to good quality green space or maybe even just open space been more important um, that 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 hour of exercise that we were allowed to do um, or the you know, being able to exercise with one other person if you're lucky um, you know as landscape architects you know we really do feel that pressure of um, focusing and helping uh, all communities really uh, improve uh, the green space that they currently have access to or creating more green space. Um, even with new developments now, we're looking at different housing standards, different development standards, so that there's better green space. And that will affect us all really in, in the offer of what's coming forward in, in developments. Um, yeah. Charlotte, do you want to pick up the conversation from there? Any, any different thoughts that you're bringing to it? Hi, uh, yeah, thank you. No, I think, um, um, so what Glenn was just saying about, you know, as landscape architects, we're, we're just one sort of subspecies, I suppose, in the, in the family of people who are interested in interventions in, in places, very broadly. Um, and I've been trying to think over the last couple of days, um, it, it answer the question in a way that should be obvious to me, because it's what I'm doing every day, is, you know, what what exactly, what is the difference between us and other, other, um, other professionals um, working in this, um, in this field? And I suppose a lot of people outside, um, outside our profession assume that it's that we know about plants. Um, and that is one of the things that we do know about. But I suppose, I think, I think there are, there's a number of, of um, or specific there's a specific frame that we bring which hopefully it will be really valuable um, through the task force which is um, we are connectors I think we are we, we we and I think the absolute fundamental point is that we work often in the realm where there is no brief so if you're an architect you generally a building generally has a clear brief um, but landscape architects are often dealing with contest, very contested space, space which doesn't have clear ownership boundaries, you know, even like legal physical boundaries are often, un, un, you know, the, the, the future use of that space is, is unpredictable, chaotic, sometimes, you know, antisocial, violent. Um, so we, we, we have to kind of be the people who step back and 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 look at this sort of glue and I think that's what we're really good at we're really good at seeing the connections between things and seeing opportunities um, but moving away from that I think fundamentally um, one of the other problems is because there's often no clear brief there's there's also often no money and no mechanism attached to our work so it's sort of going off into quite a sort of broad perhaps political philosophical thought of what landscape politics can do um but I'll, I'll maybe leave it there for now but um hopefully we can pick up right. on that later on and, and and tim from your perspective uh charlotte's talked about um we're connectors um we often work um in areas where we have to make bridges between a brief that's maybe not well defined and I guess town centres and, and the high streets are really complex environments where those things come into a sharp focus. Any thoughts from your perspective? Absolutely. Really well made points by um, Charlotte. They're helpful. Um, I think maybe going back to sort of the start of the process, I think, you know, as landscape architects, we're really good at appreciating um, the issues going on in a place. We can quite quickly visit somewhere and get a sense of the spaces between buildings the highway network, you know, what's working well, what's not working so well. And, you know, from that appreciation, starting to pull together a, a kind of diagnosis. And, and as Charlotte mentioned, you know, starting to pull together that brief, you know, where are we going? How, how can we guide our clients and our, our stakeholders? And I think we're also really good at collaborating. So we, um, I'm going to speak for myself. I, I don't think we're hugely precious about who we are. You know, we'll work with anybody. We'll work with other professionals um, and stakeholders and really, you know, as Charlotte talked about, the kind of bringing the glue together sort of in collaboration, finding a route forward uh, uh, and, and sort of defining a roadmap. 
Um, and I think, you know, I think all landscape architects would agree, we, we, we work on such a diverse range of, of projects, you know, we, we develop these skills of adaptability and flexibility, and I think that really puts us in good stead for this, this kind of work. Great. Um, Laura, um, we, we've, I've heard a couple of words there that are resonating with me at the moment. Um, connectors and collaborators. Um, what about you from your thoughts? No, I think that's very important. And I think unlike uh, some other professions where you can, as Charlotte has said, you have a very defined brief and you're designing an object. When you're a landscape architect, you're, you're in charge of the space between the objects. And the issue of ownership is also something, I'm talking about uh, your emotional ownership of the space. I'm not talking about the legal ownership. In a, in a high street, who is the community? Is it the shopkeeper? Is it the person who lives there? Is it the student you know, who happens to be passing through? Or is it the driver who's passing through? So there are quite often a lot of conflicting attitudes and, and requirements that, that we have to balance. And the other issue as well is that as the needs of our high street and our requirements become much more complex, we want to get more and more in. And we're led by standards and policy. And we could all, if you asked us to design the best street for cyclist, we could do that. You could ask me to design the best street for someone with a visual impairment, we could do that too. But the problem in, in high streets is that you have to have that Venn diagram and you're trying to find the overlap so that you are catering for everyone's needs and you're not prejudicing someone else. And the other key thing is you can't actually change the shape of the space you've got. People want to get more and more in, but you're defined by the buildings. So you're constrained. So what we need to balance is, and this is where some of the looking at the data and the research that the High Street Task Force are doing, looking at parking studies, looking at shopping surveys, looking at footfall, are people's perception of their space actually correct? Because it's quite interesting, sometimes they're not. And in consulting with people as well, we need to make sure, as I had alluded to, that you're getting to the correct people. And sometimes it's the hard to reach members of, of our communities, uh, those with disabilities, to make sure that we can, we can engage with them. Um, in some of our work in, in Glasgow and Byers Road, actually, and on the Avenues project, um, which is a large infrastructure improvement, 115 million pounds worth of infrastructure improvements in Glasgow city centre, we were very conscious that we actually needed to engage with everybody and that included people with disabilities. So we did accessibility walks um, where we went round uh, with individuals and you realize that everybody has a different interpretation of their street and how they move about it. So I think the point that, that my other colleagues have made about collaboration is important. And sometimes that is where we go into a local authority. And in my career, on a number of occasions, we've actually, I've gone in as the landscape architect, but worked as a secondment or embedded on the client side to build capacity in the authority. And I think that's extremely important. And giving a voice to some of the improvement groups and um, community groups that are involving as well is equally important. And just the last thing I think we've got to be careful about when we're looking at this is we need people, but sometimes you can get swayed by the symptom and addressing the symptom rather than the cause. And what I was going to use to illustrate that example was a lady who, was who had a disability, couldn't get up her high street. And one of the reasons was it came down to the policy about refuge collection and the fact that it wasn't frequent enough. And you had these large industrial bins all over the public realm blocking the drop curbs she couldn't get up now little did we know that changing the policy and refuge collection was actually going to unlock some of the potential of that high street fantastic thank you for that i'm, I'm just kind of sitting here thinking um the the five the six of us um all come from geographically very dispersed places i'm, I'm sitting here with the sun streaming in in belfast here um but we're all across the uh, the uk High Street Task Force is focused on, uh, on work across uh, England, um, but I'm just thinking, as you're speaking, Laura, actually, some of those insights that we're, we're all bringing from different parts of not only the UK, but beyond that, are actually quite helpful, I, I think. Um, and you just touched on uh, the importance of evidence gathering. Could you maybe say a little bit about um, some of your experience? And I'm thinking as well about 
um, in Scotland, they've been doing some really helpful stuff with the place standard and about that's about data capture, isn't it? Um, and I'm just yeah. wondering if across our different areas where we work, um, whether we're seeing some helpful little sort of uh, tools that we can maybe uh, bring to the conversation when we when we start to look at towns across England. No, I think there's there's a lot of that. And I know that uh, Scotland's Town Partnership and Phil Prentice um, and a number of others have been uh, supportive in helping the High Street Task Force. We maybe have the advantage of, of being able to look back on schemes that we have worked on uh, and learn the lessons from those. The toolkit and analysing what makes a good space is very important. Architecture and Design Scotland also look at uh, have a standard for caring places. We're keen to get people back into the community how do you achieve that? So these things are, are all very important. Uh, we have a Scotland Loves Local, which is a very important uh, initiative that's supported by central government. Working cross party is another issue that is a, a lesson I think we need to learn because we've, we've heard other uh, speakers say about housing, getting more people living back in the town. We've, got, we've talked about traffic and transportation. So there's no, you can't just say that it's one department that needs to look at this. And economic recovery, Scotland is driving its Love Local campaign because one pound spent in your local high street can actually flip six times. So don't go and spend it in the big corporate, spend it in your local independent shops. Glenn, would you like to pick up the, uh, th that thread a bit more? Absolutely, I mean, uh, d diversity on the panel, I think is uh, you know, uh, really important where we've come from um, uh, where we work. Um, my practice is in central London, um, but you know, I, I, you can tell I don't come from central London um, somehow. Um, we're, we're spoiled in London and the regions with the GLA, the, you know, the mayor's plan, London plan, the um, GLA standards, the TF Transport London standards, healthy streets, living streets. So all of these publications, you know, uh, work for us in, in the work that we're doing. Um, so um, yeah, I mean, I think um, having a panel, even although the, the mandate for the High Street Task Force is England only, having a panel that's not just England, I think um, adds to a greater wealth of um, knowledge and experience. And, and Tim, uh, I guess, as we, at some point over the next year or so, um, go into action as experts, we need to understand these different places, but we also need to understand um, how they function as well. Um, I, I sense that we probably also have some benefits here of seeing how different governance structures, how different community structures work um, in the different places that we've experienced. Absolutely. So yeah, I was just going to pick up some work I'm doing at the moment in North Wales for Conway Council, uh, a town on the coast there called Abergelly. Uh, and each of those towns in, in, on that north coast of, of Conway has uh, what, what's called a place plan. Um, now, the focus is, is, is about the town centre and connections to uh, green spaces and, and the importance of people being able to live fit and healthy lives and to be able to access the town centres easily, easily sorry, um, and really bringing together not just um, uh, businesses but also communities and uh, a wide range of s stakeholders there's apparently the incredible edibles abigeli there so a group that's looking at some of this guerrilla uh, allotments you know on, on spare pieces of land so i personally have learned a lot from you know working in wales definitely a different uh, policy approach different funding approach and and, and certainly lots of uh, Lots to learn from there. I just want to drop in. I, I've also lived in Scotland myself. There's a number of Scots on this panel or <laughs> Scots base. So I, I've had my uh, seven years in Scotland uh, living in Stirling. This is actually before uh, university. So I know Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen very well. And, and certainly that you know, experience of travel and different traditions is, is really helpful. Just, you know, being based in the Northwest, but hopefully can drawing on um you know the other home nations and just lastly before I pass on you know the, the great work of Jan Dale the Danish architect or landscape architect who, who really does some fabulous analysis about the space between buildings. Absolutely. Charlotte I'm not going to ask you to say whether you've got Scottish connections or not but um, where I is... Look, I probably look the most Scottish of everybody <laughs> but no. <laughs> Yes, what I maybe uh, like to pick up with you in terms of that geographical spread is the 
Um, when we look at uh, high streets going forward, they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. We've got dispersed rural communities, we've got um, inner urban issues. Um, I guess your, your practice is based in an area where you've got a combination of scales of places um, uh, and, and the issues that come with those. Um, yes, um, that's, yeah, I mean, a lot of our, uh, although we're out here in, in, in semi-rural Suffolk, we are in a very rural place and, um, and our local town is Ipswich, which is, a, I mean, that's a really interesting, um, you know, Suffolk's quite a wealthy county with pockets of rural deprivation. Ipswich is, scores very highly on the kind of indices of multiple deprivation, certainly in the centre of Ipswich. It's got a lot more in common with a a sort of post-industrial northern town than an East Anglian, you know, what you might imagine an East Anglian um, market town would, would have. So uh, I suppose our um, being, yeah, being very aware of, of um, that no one solution fits all. We've got, we, 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 we all as landscape architects have those analytical tools um, to, 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 to try and tease out what is, what is the essence of this place backed up by you know statistics and, and mapping and and, and 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 data but there is that it is really important I suppose not to not to go in with preconceptions um, I mean I was just I just wanted to pick up actually on what Tim was saying about um, Yang Gale's work because one one thing that's really useful I often go back to those those books and their and their very good website and their toolkits um, is that they're, they're very good at, at something really simple. It's really important. I think it kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier about spaces which, which lack ownership and definition and a, and a, and a brief. Um, and Jan Gels they t really names spaces so that you're very clear about what it is that this, this space is doing. Is it a focal point? Is it a destination? Is it just a route? Is it a back of house service place? And that, that, you know, so we, we're quite good at, I think, as landscape politics at, at trying to name things that don't, you know, and, and that help, and then vision, and then visioning it um, um, in, in um, as in a visual, you know, visually communicating what it is and what it could be. Um, so that's one of our kind of special skills. The other thing I wanted to mention actually was um, going back to something I think that um, everybody was um, mentioning earlier is, um, Master, master planning, um, I think, is moving on and it, away from this kind of development, strategic development site orientated plan into um, more, more of a vision. And we're working in Basildon at the moment, which is a really, really interesting, um, completely different scenario from, um, say, Ipswich or anywhere in London, because it's a Mark or Newtown, um, which has kind of been slowly eroded um, over the past sort of 20 years into through that sort of 90s shopping centre development. And what they're doing there is they've moved away from their um, quite recent spatial development site oriented master plan into um, a much more flexible um, guiding principles type plan. And I think that's, that's, going, that's, that's going to be very, very effective um, for helping to get people to test proposals as they come forward um, at any scale a very it's a really i'm sort of so i'm covering all kinds of things in, in one sentence here <laughs> um but um yeah i probably should just stop talking now because it's got into um it's got into kind of multiple ends. but yeah i think that that visioning is something that that visioning and naming to sum it up is what i think is something that we can bring um, and I'm hoping that through the task force, we've got an opportunity to, to support particularly local authorities where they don't, you know, for the past 20 odd years, they haven't had people like us generally embedded in them anymore. And they don't tend to, well, a lot of the smaller authorities like Ipswich probably don't have money um, or um, to, to engage us at this kind of briefing, naming, visioning stage. You've lined up a whole so. load of issues there that we can pick up over the next <laughs> yeah. wee while, haven't you? This is what it's like <laughs> inside my head, Andrew. <laughs> well, the now I could just, just unpack. 
Matt. I just wanted to say one thing. Sorry, just I think that's a really good point, I suppose, just reflecting from the, the, the task force team and, and the way we're going to approach this. The reality is that the, the majority of local authorities that we go into, because of the way they've been selected and the need that they have, they're not likely to have signed off master plans or amazing consultation documents or or, or be nearly there and over the line. I, I, you know, some will, and that'll be good, but, but some will be very much at the start of the process. And I really echo those points. I mean, I, I thought it was interesting as well what Laura was saying earlier about the sort of emotional ownership of place. I'll give you a little bit of a parallel through COVID. I've spoken to a lot of local authorities and businesses and interest groups in towns. And on this ownership issue, I kept on getting asked over and over again, who is responsible for COVID secure public space? And, and I, I got asked that on every single webinar and event I was doing. And the simple answer to them was, well, everyone is responsible. I can't even give you a legal sort of recourse. You know, even, even if the police can come along and enforce it, that's not how things operate. And I see the parallel there with, with, with green space and a, a, the different perspective on it, because when they haven't got those plans developed, there isn't really those sort of footholds and handholds to get into and sort of define what is needed and, and even what is wanted. So I'm really interested from this discussion about how do you tease that out without sort of leading a community that to, to what your idea is of a sort of preconceived successful scheme, really? I think that's a massive challenge for, for the consultation that, that we'll be doing. And in many ways, part of that challenge is about help uh, is, is how as experts we can help to engage a wide range of stakeholders in those conversations, isn't it? So that um, people are seeing the issues and to use uh, Charlotte's phrase, naming them in a sense, um, uh, being able to describe what some of those um, changes are that they're seeing and, and what the impacts of those are. Um, because whilst we've been given the title of experts, in reality, everyone's an expert, aren't they? We, we, we have to empower all of the people, whether they're shopkeepers, counsellors or whoever, um, to, to bring their expertise to those conversations. Um, and again, I'm just sort of looking at the, uh, the, the participant list this morning. Um, and uh, as Matt has already done, encourage people to sort of start chipping in with uh, on, the, on the, the chat line. But I think we need to encourage people to, um, to see their high streets and, and see those processes of change. Um, I'm sure all of us have, uh, have watched places change over these, these last um, number of years, whether it's somewhere that we grew up or somewhere that we've worked. Maybe if we take a couple of minutes now just to sort of um, almost not take a step back from the professional view, almost the emotional view, the, uh, um, those connections that we all build up with places. Let's just spend a few minutes just sort of uh, ha having a think about some places that we've known and some of the things that we've seen over these years um, uh, which, looking at the participant list, uh, let's encourage you all to be thinking about somewhere that um, is close to your hearts, um, or actually somewhere that's a real concern to you. Um, and, and let's start to think about some of those issues that, uh, that we're identifying. Tim, do you want to have a, a, a rattle at um, somewhere that's close to your heart and some of the changes that you've uh, seen over the years? Sure. Yeah, it's not uh, close to my heart and not too far from me as well physically. So um, I'm the, I live in Sale uh, in South Manchester and a place near to me is Altrincham, which is a, you know, Cheshire market town that really declined, particularly after the 2008 uh, recession. And I understand that um, sort of in, by 2010, 30% vacancy are on ground floor units, you know, in, in real dire straits. But I think what I've, I've noticed is that um, clearly there's just been a, a great uh, partnership that's come together to really try and address that and, and um, you know, bring people from the council, uh, businesses, uh, community groups um, really together and, and, and really drive a, a vision forward. What's really interesting is that there is the traditional market hall, which, again, sadly, was, I think, pretty much on its knees. But a, a chap, Nick Johnson, who's a, a surveyor based in Manchester, had this vision for it initially starting to bring in these sort of speciality events in, in the market hall. And then eventually it was refurbished. So it became very sort of food and beverage uh, focused. And I think that's really, um, really acts as a catalyst. It's it's 
that in itself, I and mean, you can never get in there. It's it, it, you know, you try, you go on a Sunday lunch, and it's you need to be there by eleven a.m. It's so popular, obviously, before COVID. Um, They've done some fabulous things on the the market, haven't they? Absolutely, for, for sure. I mean, great sort of individual, uh, you know, sort of. Uh, around the side there's a you know individual sort of uh, food sellers and then what you've seen around the market hall is this sort of uh, arrival of independent food and beverage you know restaurants and bars uh, and then the public realm has been uh, you know radically uh, upgraded so it, it it's just a, you know you know putting it bluntly really it's transformation in 10 years um, so around about 10 year time span of that sort of process of change yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, it's occurred a bit quicker than that, actually. I mean, I think really probably five to six years, we've seen quite a good deal of change. So I think it has been quicker, but it's clearly, you know, sustained. And, and interesting, you've kind of uh, almost name checked a person who was very influential there. Um, I wonder if that might be a common theme here of individuals who are really important to driving initiatives forward as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Nick Johnson, I, I understand he's, he, he was involved with Urban Splash, which I'm, I'm sure many of you know. And then I believe that he's instigated the sort of Mackey's Mare in Manchester, which is a, the old meat market, which is now very successful. And I think also uh, a space in Macclesfield, not too far away. So um, and just really before I hand over my my localist centre, my five minute walk uh, is Sale Town Centre. And it's really not not a town centre to be proud of, but a fabulous bit of initiative in the last year or so by several independents, including groceries and beer, which, you know, the name gives it away. It's a shop, but it's a cafe. It's a place to eat. And then every week they have a different street uh, food seller. You know, it's um, uh, that comes in and, and sells their their food and it's still working uh, today because they do a, um, a takeaway this week it's wholesome junkie and next week it's dim sum soup Tim just before we let you off the hook there um, um, question has come in here can you tell us a little bit about the the funding of um, the the work in in sale um, uh, the, the public realm work there in Altrincham Sorry, in Altrincham, beg your pardon? I, I think I'd probably have to look that up to be ac totally accurate, but I'm, I'm guessing it really would have come from the local authority, from Trafford Council, potentially with some support from the Business Improvement di District, but it, it really is, um, you, you know, very well executed from my opinion. Right. Glenn, right at the very outset, you talked about um, uh, a journey professionally in terms of what you've seen um, from the retail perspective. Is that echoing some of the things that you've seen in, in a high street that you've got a bit of a care for? So I'm uh, southwest London and one of the regional shopping centres that I've frequented for many years um, is Kingston upon Thames, Royal Borough of Kingston upon Thames. And I suppose Kingston, um, it, it has a multi-layered offer and you could say, I'm assuming uh, that it's, uh, it would be designated a resilient town centre. Um, it's got so many things going for it. It's right next to River Thames. It's um, County Town, Royal, Royal Borough, Kingston upon Thames, pedestrianised High Street. It's got um, historic Market Square. Um, uh, it's got you know major shopping centre, John Lewis Anchor Store. Uh, outside of the shopping centre, it's got um, shopping malls, um, shopping streets. Uh, uh, that, that, and and so. Really, uh, I would say a resilient uh, shopping centre. However, going through that town centre as I do every Sunday morning on my cycles, I counted 15% vacancy. So that's just above the national average, which I think is sitting about 14 at the moment, mm -hmm. um, if my data is correct, Matt. 15% um, vacancies uh, on, on the high street, which is absolutely shocking uh, for uh, uh, what I would consider a resilient town. Um, uh, uh, with such a diverse offer and you know we really got to be considering um, with the effect of lockdown and, and Covid and changing work patterns and work from home you know how, how is the re retail going to change how is that town centre going, going to change when when that's an example I would say of uh, a, a resilient uh, um, town centre with a lot going for it, a really diverse offer you know, from the large multiples right down to independence, you can pretty much find everything you, you want there. Um, so just a good example, I suppose, of, of a re resilient town centre, still struggling. 
that's probably one of the first times we've used the, the word resilient uh, so strongly. Do you get the feeling that they have been planning to be resilient or have they almost accidentally got the, uh, the ingredients to be resilient? Good question, I'd like to know the answer. <laughs> As an expert, we maybe find out in uh, weeks to come. <laughs> yes, I wonder if they're on the list. <laughs> Laura, and, do you want to... Andrew, Sorry. Andrew, could I just jump in in question time yes. fashion? Go for it. Is that, is that okay? It's just to add to Kingston upon Thames. So I've I've known that town centre since the early nineties. My parents moved there in the early nineties. Uh, Glenn, I don't know if you would have been around in that time, but certainly th that great asset that you mentioned, the River Thames, that used to be essentially lined by multi-storey car parks. Uh, and and at, in the early 90s, there was just no realization of that connection to the river. You know, what a fabulous asset. So what I've seen in my 30 years of going down to Kingston Town, visiting my parents, is that gradual transformation of that connection back to the river. And, it, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's re again, really transformed in that time. But that suggests that it's been very considered as well, that there is, there is a, an understanding of the issues and that there is a, a conscious decision to shape um, decisions uh, that have ended up with it being better than it was. Absolutely, and just spotting those opportunities. You know, sometimes yeah. it's the road, the, the multi-story car park that's just kind of blocking that link to an asset. And if that, if you know, if one of us can have that vision to sort of see that and present that and get that sold, then we're doing well. And in uh, you, you were just saying in uh, question time fashion. I wonder if we should take the opportunity. Seeing a couple of hands up here, um, Beth Houston, um, you stuck your hand up there. I'm going to see if I can allow you to talk. Do you want to say anything, Beth? You've got to have your hand up for a while. Can you hear me? Yeah, got you. Um, I was just going back to um, when Tim was talking about the marketplace and you um, asked us to reflect on where we're from. And I, I live in Chester, which is quite literally has, a, has multi-layered shopping outlets with the historic rows. But um, my question really was, uh, was about the market because Chester's had... Um, a really thriving marketplace recently because the old building actually was starting to deteriorate and they were going to put a new development in before, be, behind the town hall. But within these plans, um, the fee, the sort of ground rent is really, really high. So lots of the existing market stall holders can't actually afford to move over to the new um, area. So I was just wondering in terms of um, resilience and protecting the high street, what we can do to make sure that plans are put in place so that existing businesses can actually afford to profit from these new areas that we develop. That makes sense? Absolutely. <laughs> Matt, you look like you're going to say something there. Just a very quick point, specifically on the market, Altringham and the, and the link to Chester there. Um, I know that in Altringham, it was a very definite plan from the start to curate a specific type of offer. Um, the, the local authority went out to tender in quite a unique way for someone to transform that space. And when the, the operator came in, um, the, the, the push first and foremost was to get that mix of independent food and beverage um, that, that was talked about. So it wasn't, yes, it's a very successful place and you know, pulls in rates, et cetera, but um, sort of cart before the horse if you're going to start pricing out the kind of offer that you want to curate, really. So I just wanted to make that point. It does take some joined up thinking with the local authority or whoever to, to make sure that doesn't happen. Charlotte, you've just popped something into the, uh, the chat line. Do you want to sort of explain what you've just managed to uh, find there? Yeah, so that's that's just um, it's just something. I mean, the whole markets are, are obviously identified by lots of people, you know, working in this in this field of, of town centres and placemaking as as really really, um, you know, essential ingredients um, for activating space and and offering, um, you know, incubating startup enterprise, um, getting young people involved in in trading and 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 you know having a, a real stake in 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 places so um i mean this this conversation is not new is it this has been you know we've been talking about this as long as as i've been involved in all of this but um i think that, that i mean there are a lot of people doing some very good work and and uh, as, in the states this is the center for um public spaces who project for public spaces and they do they've got some really really useful resources 
um, from over there worth a look at. I just, I just can I just chip in about so, just thinking about Kingston. I know Kingston quite well too because my second job was in Kingston, <laughs> in the high street. Um, in the was 80s. that also a grocer's job or not? That was um, that was in a well-known um, high street um, <laughs> health food shop. <laughs> Um, with a green uniform. Um, that, other brands that, are also available. Other brands are also available. So King, King's, yeah, Kingston, but Kingston's got so much going for it, as you say. I mean, it did also, you know, it had its had its issues. Um, and it, that the, that parking, I just wanted to pick up on this parking thing, because obviously Kingston, Kingston is fundamentally different from, say, somewhere like Ipswich, because it's is a it's wealthy. You know, there is there is money there. For, from all kinds of sources, including you know local inhabitants, um, um, but parking, parking always parking. Going back to connecting back to Kingston and parking blocking, you know, really um, important assets and connections in the town, um, and thinking about um, money and revenues and who owns spaces. But it strikes me that. You know, one thing that local authorities, um, particularly the highways authorities, have, have got ownership of and and have a clear definition of, of role for is par is parking. You know, aside from roads, it's parking spaces, and you know they're hot. It's hotly contested, but I just I always come back to thinking, it's it's parking. We need we need parking. We still need parking. We're probably going to still need you know lots of parking for for a long time to come of some form or other, but parking is also such a blight and such a land hungry greedy use of space so you know maybe there is there is this more um one of the ways in to some of these problems is looking at space that's used for parking and whether or not it can be more multifunctional and markets is one obvious um so, you know, an alternative to established markets, perhaps that in lots of towns like Ipswich could also host um, more of a pop-up startup type low-cost market, like Beth was saying. You know, there are lots of um, barriers to entry, even into to market stall operating. So that's a, yeah, that's another sort of bundle of things all um, rolled into one sentence. Tim, you've got a bit of breathing space. I think that uh, Beth was kind of uh, lining this one up for you. Anything else that you'd like to bring in? And I'm, I'm going to chip in as well. Um, I was just thinking, you were mentioning about the pricing of places um, and markets are one thing, but I'm sure most of us have heard Wayne Hemingway speaking about the importance of um, cheap units to get entrepreneurs uh, started on the, the high street. So it's not just um, uh, the market. You've mentioned the word pop up there. Tim, any, anything that you want to add to that conversation? Yeah, um, yeah. thanks for your question, Beth. And, and there may be a scheme you, you may be familiar with, Hatch, in, in Manchester under the Mancunian Way. So for those of you who don't know Manchester, we have this wonderful flyover just south of the city centre. And um, it's always been a bit of a no man's land. But in recent years, Hatch have um, kind of colonised it and they use shipping containers and, and, and sort of small market units and there's a space for food and drink and concerts. Uh, and I know talking to Bruntwood, I think you helped to, to manage that space. They give very flexible, uh, um, they give a space uh, very much on sort of flexible terms, you know, short term uh, leases, very cheap, uh, very accessible to, to lots of types of um, of traders. So that's that's one example sort of really from the Manchester area. So Hatch uh, under the Mancunian way. Fine. I'm seeing another hand up there. Um, Beth, is that is that good for you in the moment? It is, yeah. Can you still, make, can you still hear me? <laughs> can hear you, absolutely. <laughs> can we move on to uh, Julia Hilton? Um, I'm seeing your hand up there. Um, Julia, have you still got a question there? I've taken you off mute in case you'd like to say something. Can you hear me now? Got gotcha. you, yes. yes. Hi, um, I just wanted uh, people to, I wondered what people had comment about the fact that we really need to rethink our town centres in terms of we can't buy our way out of this. We know we've got to think about a whole new way of being with the climate crisis and um, uh, how we can think about it being a centre for the new circular economy that we need to be developing. We need to be thinking about libraries of things, repair cafes, uh, bike hubs, 
and what people think about the principle of using the donut economics principles for building our local economy. So we're building within planetary limits. I know Cornwall County Council is basing all their um, projects now and various towns are taking on these principles. And I just wondered what, uh, whether the town centre, um, uh, sorry, I've forgotten your acronym. Um, is I, taking I all task force. <laughs> the street task force. It's taking on those principles because I really think this is an opportunity to um, to move away from how we've thought about stuff before. We need a whole new paradigm, really. What a brilliant question. Um, Laura, do you want to have a, a rattle at that one? Yes, I think it's uh, quite important and whether we're talking about donuts or polo mints, but I know that um, <laughs> we did talk a lot about towns becoming polo mints because town centres died because everyone was rushing to the perimeter. So you had your out of town shopping, you had your big multi supermarkets and the town centre, then the reason for people going into the town centre was getting lost. And even local governments started to relocate offices, schools, art centres outside the town. So it wasn't surprising that the actual core of our historic town started to die. And one of the things I'm thinking of, I did a lot of work in Dumfries and it's interesting seeing over a period of time how things change. So Dumfries was hit by the polo mint idea. The town centre had died. There were vacant shops, charity shops moved in, but they started slowly to improve things. And learning from other places, I think this is quite interesting that in Scotland, we now have uh, the mid steeple quarter and it's a community benefits society that has been set up by the community where it's not run by the council it was actually supported by stove and there are over 400 members of the community bought some vacant properties and they then run them for startups and and other things like this so we do need to look at how we use our town centers differently we do need to support the entrepreneurs and the, those that want to have the pop-up um opportunities and it does have to be different. But the thing that we need to have to be successful in a town centre, all successful places are well-used spaces. So we need to get the people back into the town centres, safely, of course. Glenn, you talked about, yeah. you used the word resilient. And yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. thinking this is all part of that okay. conversation, isn't it? Yeah, Julia, you make some really good points there. And you, you threw in quite a lot, um, uh, which, which is great. And I, I think the sentiment really is, we can't be tinkering here. This is structural change. This is uh, um, everything that we thought was real uh, should be reinvestigated. Nothing's off the table. I think this is a this is a national initiative, and we shouldn't underestimate the the, the scale of the the task. Um, you know, we, we're we're a small part of that, but you know, this is this is a much much bigger debate. It's not just about local. Well, it is ultimately about local economies, but all but also central government and planning uh, has a role to play in this. So really two things that I wanted to bring to bear in that whilst we've been talking about uh, specific issues, I wanted to bring in the Landlord and Tenant Act and the review of the Landlord and Tenant Act. So the relationship between tenants, retail tenants or high street tenants um, and landlords, I think is, uh, is a big part of um, how regeneration, sustainable regeneration, kickstarting regeneration for high streets uh, um, could or should be part of that. Upwardly new, renewable rents only, uh, maybe a thing of the past, um, and maybe start bringing in something that is um, turnover driven. But you know that's a, that's a major change in in the, in the UK um, and and something that um, could or, or should be involved in. And then also planning use classes uh, with the local authorities. I think it's another. Um, uh, uh, interesting why I'm, I'm on, a, on a number of design review panels uh, reviewing significant schemes in London area for different authorities and um, vacant units or developments that are creating new um, ground floor units um, on the high street or in the town centre you know maybe there should be more flexibility on planning use classes if there are um, lots of businesses that are going bust as a result of this uh, mini recession uh, does that mean that there is going to be lots more startups and enterprise units? And if we like going to cafes with our laptops, then maybe entrepreneurs and business, uh, new business uh, owners um, can, can share co-working space. So maybe there's an opportunity for vacant units 
to have co-working space um, that helps bring in professionals or anybody actually just, just wanting to run a business, start a business. If you're working from home, you don't want to do it all the time. You actually want to be gregarious like we are as humans and get into the town centre maybe for lunchtime and do your work and meet others um, and then spend money in the, in the high street. So that, that really feeds into the experiential change for high streets rather than just shopping. You know, shopping as a pastime, uh, I think, is now in the past. Uh, we don't, you know, I used to go shopping with my family just for the sake of shopping. I didn't need anything, but I was just shopping for the sake of it. So I think, is that a thing of the past? So a few things there, Landlord's Tenant Act and planning use classes just want to bring into that debate. Charlotte, you must be a nightmare to play uh, Zoom quizzes with because you're so quick off finding the, the references. You popped in another one onto the chat line there uh, about circular economy. Do you want to pick up on that one? Well, it's, it's, it's just something that I've been I've been thinking about in particular in, in um, is sort of, you know, it, it's often outside the scope of our direct influence as landscape architects and projects, unfortunately, but um, it's, it is absolutely critical, isn't it, that we we look to, as a as a society, um, break down whatever the barrier, economic um, or political barriers are to to reusing um, empty, well, particularly empty shops, and you know, more and more probably commercial space in general, office space is going to be a is going to be a huge problem. And you know, yet personally, I would love to move my office back into town. And share share the burden of that with um, you know other other individuals or small businesses. Um, and yet yeah, there is you know there are I don't know absolutely masses of empty shops, for example, in Ipswich and commercial property. But for some reason, despite the fact that land values here are quite well in town are quite low, um, rents and all the rest of the the burden is still really high. Um, there are huge numbers of empty shops, but a lot of them are owned by um, offshore or pension funds or unknown, you know, bodies. Um, so there's, there's, there is no community space at present or, or incubator type space that is suitable. So I, it's something I'm always, I'm, I'm constantly on the lookout and thinking, how can we influence this? Um, as a company, yeah. we used to have a, a, a property, um, a lease, a, a business lease on, a, on a, an old warehouse building it on the docks. And we had two or three other um, small practices that were in that was our sub tenants, um, but it's a huge burden, um, and yeah, I think it's a very, very interesting and useful multi multi use multi occupancy breaking down some of these kind of legal, political, and financial um, barriers to reusing town centre spaces. I'm up for that. Julia, your question was a particularly insightful one. Are there any other angles that you want to uh, uh, make us think about or encourage us to think about? Oh, hi. Um, no, more a practical one. That um, I think there's two different chat boxes um, because I can't see these links that people are mentioning. And Adam has also said that he can't either. Oh. So we're on the chat box on the, on the Futurescape website. And I think there must be another one on the Zoom website. Oh, I wonder if dear. So if Adam's so, put something in, I haven't seen that. I've seen a handful, right? Okay. If you if you open the chat within, if you're in the Zoom application, there should be chat at the bottom of your screen um, on a menu, but um, that's the one that it's been put into. If, yeah, if we're on the back I'm foot on that, if we're on the back foot on that one, if people have put questions in, could you maybe put your hand up as well? So we, we'll pick them up that way. So yeah, Julia, any, any little insights that you would like us to uh, bear in mind on that front? Um, I, well, I just really liked what, um, sorry, I'm terrible at remembering names and I've got a cold today, so my head's not working. Um, uh, the Community Benefit Society approach up in um, Dumfriesshire, and I know so, uh, I'm based in Hastings and um, there's a big push. We've um, got Heritage Action Zone in the centre and a lot of empty shops and they're beginning to be bought up by a sort of community land trust um, combination with a sort of social enterprise developer. Um, and I think that is a really interesting model for how we 
regenerate places in a way that's actually owned by local people. Um, so you're not reliant, like we've got a huge Debenhams um, that's probably going to shut. And there's all sorts of plans for the building, but it's owned by um, an offshore venture capitalist. So how do we, you know, they've sold off their property. So now local people are reliant on, you know, lots of offshore people to, um, to be able to, you know, to make that change. They don't actually own, own the assets. And I think that's a really important um, point that you know if we're gonna if, if we're gonna involve local people then they need to be able to uh, have some power in in the discussion and they often don't. Matt just wondering as the the high street uh, task force unfolds are you going to have a, a, a sort of um, a resource there that you can help people to see lessons that are being learned from across uh, not only England but uh, beyond as well? Yes we are so we'll be publicizing all the work that we do as far as we can you know and that goes down to sort of the advice that's given and the successes or routes that, that um, places are taking so we will be doing we're building as well and we'll share the website address at the end but we're building a, a resource library of case studies from around the world really of these different types of approaches it's worth saying that when we so we'll draw from all of these different areas for example when we ran a, a webinar series in the summer reacting to covid we had a specific webinar which did address community ownership we, we worked with claire's on that and we completely um get those issues I, I think that was the key point you mentioned julia about resilience through community ownership is, is key but there are lots of other benefits as well of course so yeah if, if people have time um uh, then go on to highstreettaskforce.org.uk and it, you can just click on resource library. You can filter it and have a browse. There's quite a lot of interesting stuff on there already. And, and I guess part of this is going to be about over the coming year, these sort of conversations of making sure that we are having the, the dialogue and encouraging people to, to think about the issues and engage with them and add to that knowledge base, isn't it? Exactly. I mean, we're, we're learning all the time. We ran a small pilot at the start of this year to test some of the processes I talked about in those slides. And even from the basic element of walking, I won't name names, but walking around places that you're there to meet the local authority and they've been told to invite all of the community and get consultation going. And, and you go door to door, obviously, of, of shops and different places, and people just don't have a clue what's going on in the area because they're not informed so at the very basic level it's that that's an eye-opener and as we move around the country i'm sure we'll see lots of unique scenarios and and um, learning from that and putting it in the public domain as far as can be sensitively done i think is, is worthwhile really yeah i'm i'm amazed in the uh, the conversation so far that we have touched on covid but actually haven't majored on it so far uh, and I'd like to maybe just have a little bit of a conversation about um, some of the, the changes that maybe have been accelerated over this last eight months that we're seeing on the high street and some of the particular challenges. Um, Tim, would you like to um, tell us about any of the, the little sort of insights that you've seen of how high streets have been responding over the last wee while, both in a challenging way, but also I, I've certainly been seeing some really uh, exciting things that people have seen opportunities and have worked in a different way to, to respond to those challenges as well. Yeah, sure. I, I think um, what I've seen is, is certainly on the high street, the need to, to allow for more protect, um, people space, obviously, the, those, the social distancing. Uh, and certainly in the in the cities in the northwest, I've seen various approaches where we've had everything from you know the traffic bollards sort of eating into the highway, but providing pedestrian space. I've seen more sensitive um, interventions where planters and and and, and sort of mobile trees, so to speak, are, are used to. Uh, create that space and then a, a particular um, sense that I'm working on at the moment in Leicestershire, Lutterworth, um, I heard recently from the our client officer that uh, one of the streets where we were hoping to do some changes to amendments to the highway, they, they'd already trialled this idea of, of, of creating more pedestrian space on the street and it had, it had been received really well so I think the job has been done for us a little bit because we thought it would be a hard job to persuade the reduction of highway space uh, and for better public well it would be a hard job to sell but it sounds like uh, the shoppers in the town and, and the businesses have, have, have sort of seen the benefits um, and hope, hopefully we can do better than tra traffic bollards but um, so yeah that's that's my perspective really. 
That's quite interesting, isn't it? Because it, I, I do sense that we've seen examples of uh, piloting, for want of a better phrase, things being tried. And are there now opportunities to uh, learn what's gone well, but also maybe the things that haven't wor worked as well as they might, and then take that into mainstream um, uh, as we move forward. So, and again, that probably goes back to Laura's thing about data gathering as well, of make sure that we understand the place and keep those conversations going um, so that we, we are, we're well informed as we make decisions as designers, as clients, as, as whatever. Absolutely. Laura, that one that you... Oh, sorry, go on, Tim. And absolutely. I mean, a point that Laura made really well earlier about this sort of negotiation of space, you know, there's, you know, there's lots of different needs for highway space and, and you know, there'll be a fight between the delivery driver and the, par the person wanting to park and then the pedestrian. But I think if we can, we just need to be really clear and keep getting over that message, the reason for trying to make more space for pedestrians. Yeah. Laura, do you want to pick that one up? Yeah, no, I would like to pick up on that. I think it is very important. And this is a thread that's running through all our sort of discussion about how can we make the space work harder? It does have to be more resilient. Um, why does it have to be the same all the time? I mean, it was quite interesting when we did a footfall count in one of the Glasgow city centre streets, that the footfall was actually higher at two o'clock in the morning when the nightclubs were ent ent you know, emptying as they were at you know, sort of the middle of the, what one would perceive as being the lunchtime rush. So there's this, well, does this, you know, a delivery space always need to be a delivery space? What can it be used for later on? And I think, I would like to come to the fact that we don't, as landscape architects, just talk about this. We are also, we can deliver and help people actually get that physical change on the ground. And part of that is thinking, if you're going to do something as, as engineering, you know, it, it is technical, it is disruptive, you are going to have to dig up the road, you are going to have to sort out the services. There are certain things you don't want to be doing every other year. And it comes back to, to our climate change, whole life costing. There are certain elements of the streetscape that you want to change once. So I go back to Dundee in the early 90s. When we started working in Dundee, there were sets from Aberdeen and we wanted to retain the sets from Aberdeen and we put other materials around it. And little did we know at that time that what we were doing then uh, that Marks and Spencers at that time would say, right, well, now we've got seats outside, we've got bollards, we've got better material, it's pedestrianised, we're going to upgrade our shop. Marks and Spencers upgraded. Then the link, so the physical thing was changing people's perception of the space. Then they got a, I think it was a Disney store came next. Now look at Dundee, and we've got the first V&A outside, you know, of London. So it just shows you again that sometimes the physical change, so there's certain elements of the physical change, like your surfacing, that car parking spaces, we can be more flexible in how we manage that. So there are management changes as well as physical changes. Brilliant. I, I'm, I'm sort of mindful that we've got about 10 minutes to go. I'm not seeing any other comments on the, the chat, but I'm slightly concerned about the fact that there's maybe a, a, a parallel universe going on here. Um, so if anyone wants to stick their hand up for something, I'm also going to encourage, a, um, as we look at those creative responses, both to the COVID situation, but also to the long term, how do we revitalize our high street? Keen, if anyone wants to chip in from the, the, from the floor uh, about their, their insights as well. Um, um, Glenn, do you want to have a... Yeah, yeah. yeah I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to respond to that, but it, stop me if there's somebody uh, from the floor who wants to, to join in. But I mean, we've got four years of the high street task force. Um, no conversation should be off the table. Um, breaking down uh, any localized barriers and stalemate issues is really one of our jobs as, as an expert, listening to local communities and um, those uh, preconceived ideas, the opportunity for us as individuals to come in and, and say, well, you know, why is that the way it is? Going back to Laura's point, town centers definitely need to respond to living patterns today the new, we've got, you know, post-COVID, the new normal and the work from home culture. If the High Street Task Force work wasn't difficult before, it's even more difficult now with um, trying to determine, well, how are we going to live uh, in the future, like in the next five years, uh, next 10 years? Uh, what will shopping patterns be like? How will we use town centres? Definitely the solutions that the task force helped to conceive with local communities, local government, uh, should be as inclusive 
and uh, appeal to all groups and ages, all ethnicities, all ages, all abilities to really bring young people, old people into the town centre. And that, you know, focuses on a diverse uh, offer um, for, for units and also green space, public space and green space. Actually, Glenn, can I ask you to elaborate on that? We've also uh, not really said too much about climate emer emergency and biodiversity. You've just mentioned green space. Right, where are we going with that one? Well, yeah, I mean, um, um, Charlotte and Laura have talked about um, parking and town centres and engineers. We love them and uh, the, the, they, they definitely love, love to follow rules. And, you know, that's the way it is. Well, no, that's not the way it is. Let's make a new normal. Let's not have parking. Let's repurpose the parking spaces. Let's have... Uh, town centres which are addressing climate emergency and designing for the future and you know addressing water runoff and having rain gardens instead of parking spaces and you know we're all moving towards electric cars aren't we um, and if you have a diesel then shame on you um, you know um, you know if you if actually have, if you have a car then shame on you um, so do we need all those um, do we know that those parking spaces um, and can we be, you know, um, lifting up paving slabs in the town centre and putting in biodiverse plantings and encouraging wildlife back into the, back into the, the town centre so that that plays into the, the experiential, the, the better experiential uh, offer for people coming into the town centre, not just about shopping or information gathering, but to meet friends. And the town centre is a really beautiful place to be, isn't it? So these are not separate issues, are they? Um, the, the experience is part of how we make places more resilient from a climate perspective and how we deal with the economic uh, resilience as well. I think, Andrew, just to, right. to, to just to reiterate some of the points Glenn's raised there and uh, also things that Charlotte and Tim have touched upon, the, the role of trees, I mean, uh, and speaking obviously in a, in a friendly environment um, and people can see trees, the value of trees for our health and well-being, but also the fact that trees have a very vital role to play in our sort of adjusting the climate, climate emergency, that it's not just about seeing them and the health and well-being, but it's also that we can use them to improve some of the issues with urban drainage. And this links back to the work that Glasgow City Council have been doing in the Avenues project, looking at rain gardens. And I know there are other great examples in Sheffield and Dublin where a lot of work has been done on this, but it's seeing things differently. And there's nothing that makes an engineer become nervous more than me going into the meeting and saying we want to put a tree in the street than, than anything else. But we need to understand, have a much more holistic way of looking at this. Um, and understanding that we can improve that because that is that is part of it. I think the other thing about cars and how people have to rely on cars, for some individuals in our society, they rely on the car because it's their mobility and they need to be able to drive from home. We're encouraging correctly people to live independently, to be able to live at home, to get to the, you know, the, the services that are on offer in the high street. And in some of the more rural towns, of course, we have maybe, you know, in, in Scotland, you'll have the same in England. If you've missed the one bus that morning, you've got to get in your car. And sometimes you're too far away to cycle. We're not all maybe the fit triathlons that uh, Glenn and Tim are, uh, Strava man. But for the rest of us that, you know, we need to we need to rely on a vehicle, but it has to be, you know, and possibly an electric vehicle. So there, there, there is that issue that we need to find appropriate solutions for each of the individual high streets and the context that we're working in. Charlotte, you, you were the one who actually kicked this off in terms of uh, the, rep the, the multiplicity of uses that we should be maybe thinking for car parks and uh, yeah. road environments. I just think parking, every single project that you know we work on, every, every place I go, you look and you see. I mean, I, I rely heavily on my car, I, I have to admit, and I've got a diesel massive diesel gas guzzling car I've got three kids and I live in the rural place um, and there are three buses a day there's no bus to the place that has a doctor's surgery local to us there's no bus to any shop more than a very very small local shop so we do rely on our car so when we go into one of our sort of local towns um, the experience of of parking is is you know obviously again the, the I completely understand that 
it's no good preaching telling people you know you, you're gonna have to park a bit further you're gonna have to sell it a lot harder than that by making the experience of of parking or public transport whatever it is and then the walking element really attractive because otherwise it's just punitive and i don't think most people are there yet in this country in terms of giving up on car use certainly not outside of the big metropolitan areas so that's just one sort of you know admission um it's, I mean, Ipswich is absolutely blighted by surface car parks um, that are, a lot of them are run by the, the, the borough council. They're a big revenue generator, or they were, and, um, but they are, they, are, they, are, they are a real blight on the town centre, um, but I can't see them giving up on them anytime soon unless there's some, you know, really big, big picture thinking. Um, but I just, I just wanted to sort of pick up on a, just one point about that sort of is a thread through a lot of what people are saying, particularly what Matt, Matt was saying um, about comms and, and communication and visioning again. And, you know, how um, we, we've got we've got it's absolutely critical to sort of to, to try and um, to try and achieve this sort of cultural shift. There's big picture talk about climate, about everybody appreciating more than ever the value of, of, of good quality space, whether it's green or otherwise, um, in, in, in towns in particular, where you haven't got access to the countryside. Um, but the, the, there's, there's, there seems to me um, there's, there's a, there is, there is, there are barriers of actually delivering this and, and parking is a mass, parking and roads is a massive one. Um, and um, then and money oh, fundamentally you know who who is who is paying for spaces that don't generate rev if they don't generate revenue how is that paid for so i think nobody's really talked much about money in this conversation um but sort of funding and and um it, it's got to be talked about you know where does this money come from i mean we've seen businesses do very innovative interesting playful things in this sort of covid um to make you know to, to adapt to COVID and local authorities, but fundamentally, um, you know, there things have to be paid for, don't they? That's that's a nice little challenge. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm looking at the clock here, and I think we've got about three or four minutes to go here. Um, and I, I wonder if that one is one which we will leave hanging for another conversation. Um, I'm not seeing any other chats on the line, and I'm not seeing hands up. So what I'd be keen to do um to to sort of bring towards a, a conclusion is little a little good news story that we've all seen i think uh, we're, we're all working in places which are challenged and uh, some of the challenges have been particularly profound over this last little while um but i think we're all seeing signs of encouragement as well so um to to finish off uh, our discussion can we have a few uplifting moments uh, from each of you I'm going to go uh, with Glenn to, to make a start on that. This is a bit like the end of the news, isn't it? Of, uh, of having that, that little last time. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping you uh, come to me last. Um, so one of the, one of the, the things that, that Matt said today has really stuck with me, which is solution agnostic. So I, I really, uh, I like that phrase. I'm going to borrow it. In fact, I might just steal it, um, <laughs> uh, which I really, it, it's about listening. For us, our role on the task force and the task force generally, a lot of it is about listening, breaking down barriers, uh, coming up with solutions that nobody's thought about, uh, working with communities, energizing those communities uh, to try and uh, bring people together so that it's their solution, not our solution. This is not top down, this is bottom up, um, uh, but we bring as a panel uh, and as an organization, a huge amount of data, a huge amount of analysis um, uh, and experience and, um, an objectivity, I suppose, um, uh, and a lack of prejudice uh, in the local area to, to you know, think about things in a different way that potentially local communities haven't thought about. So I'm, I'm really excited to, to start. I can't, can't wait, really. Fantastic. Laura, I'm going to go to you next. Yes, um, I think it's, it's easy to get scared by the enormity of the task. But actually, you've just got to start. Do something small. 
The Scotland Loves Local campaign is about getting out into your local high street and start spending, you know, spend your money there. Because if you spend it in the local coffee shop there, then they're employed there. They go and spend it in the hairdressers and they say it's measured. It, they do reckon that it flips six times in the local economy. I think the other thing is not to get too hung up. We do need to measure, but as, as we said right at the start, you need to observe how people move in this particular time because we're humans. We don't all reply to their logarithm, but really people just need to get out and support their high streets and enjoy them. Brilliant. Charlotte? Um, yeah, um, this is not, specific, not particularly related to COVID, but we've been in, involved with... Um, a small pocket park project in the centre of Walthamstow in northeast London um, recently. And like a lot of projects, it came on the back of a, a big development project. So it was a section 106 type arrangement. But Walthamstow, um, Walthamstow Borough have um, a really, probably most of you are familiar with it, a really quite exciting strategic um, project called uh, Mini Holland which is all about promoting cycling. And on the back of that, so the highways have led that project. And on the back of that, a lot of smaller projects have been able to slot in, including community led projects. They've been able to access funding, you know, management mechanisms and mechanisms for getting capital works done. Um, so the, the, our little pocket park is, is being built now by highways and their contractors, but that we've not seen sight of it, but the local um, gardening and Walthamstone Bloom, very energetic people have just done the, done the kind of planting work and they're gonna manage it. This really gives me a lot of hope actually that there are kind of ways to, to mesh these, um, you know, um, big strategic kind of highways, for example, type structures with, you know, local people on the ground. Fabulous. And Tim? Um... Yeah, probably picking up a bit on Laura's point. Um, I think people love sense of place and, and, and what's local. You know, I think many of our town centres have great heritage. Sadly, some of that's been, you know, um, hidden by shop fronts. But if you look above the shop front, you probably see a really interesting facade. So I think, you know, if we can really um, harness what's unique and, and, and that sense of place for our town, our high streets, then, you know, we can get people back. Also, what I've been noticing is, is people really like independence. They like to... to to um, buy a local store you know, where they know that the, the owners are local and they've sourced uh, materials locally. So I think that, that gives us a lot of hope to, to move forward. Yeah. Matt, just before I say a, a last sort of uh, goodbye, um, do you want to say how people can get involved? Uh, we've, got, uh, around, we've had about 40 particip participants on the call this morning. Um, how can people be involved in the work of the task force? So I'll just share this um, web address again whilst I'm just talking. But the first thing to do is if you go to the, to the site on the screen there, um, I mentioned the resources that are online already, but register. There's a big button that says um, get involved or register or something of that fashion. You can give us your email address and we'll update you as things are moving. Um, and, and it's important to do that because we'll also be, as well as reporting on what we're doing, There'll be certain times where we'll, we'll be asking for input as well, because we certainly don't have all the answers. So we'll be asking our experts for that, but also asking for case studies and people to highlight these good stories and things that have been going on. So I think just, just head there and give us a follow and um, keep your eyes uh, peeled. And it will be early next year when we are able to publicise the full programme for 2021, where we'll be in the country and, and, and how we're kicking off really. So thanks for the opportunity today, Andrew, appreciate it. Matt, really appreciate uh, your, your knowledge and insights from that. So, so thank you for that. Um, and I'm mindful that we're uh, now three mi minutes into um, extra time here. Um, I, I think uh, those of us who are football followers will recognize that actually um, uh, games tend to go on a lot longer than they used to do, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll try and bring this one to a fairly swift close. I'd like to thank my uh, uh, panel uh, guests this morning for, for their insights, but I would like to thank all of you sitting in your homes, your offices, your wherevers across the country for, for being engaged in this conversation. Uh, there's never been a more important time for our high streets. Um, what's happened with COVID has accelerated some of the challenges that we're seeing um, coming anyhow. Um, and this is our chance to, um, 
put the spotlight on why they are so important. The knowledge that um, people locally have, the skills that are, are, are local, but also the skills that we can draw in, whether it's through the task force or others. And, and I guess shamelessly as uh, the Landscape Institute, the role that we can play. Uh, we are bridge builders. We are, we have got skills which uh, are very appropriate for some of these complex situations where um, the brief isn't clear, uh, where we do need to deal with the climate resilience and the biodiversity issue whilst dealing with circular economies. We're a profession um, which is well skilled in that respect and, and let's rise to that challenge. So thank you for being with us this morning and um, uh, I wish you well in whatever you're doing this afternoon. Thanks ever so much. Bye now. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye everyone. We lost Andrew already. So I would have thought uh, we would have flipped back into the chat room because it's still recording. <laughs>